Hi, and welcome to my podcast. My name is Joanne, and this is the Creative Mojo Podcast, and I'm coming to you from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, this is episode two, and uh, I want to thank any of you who watched episode the first episode, and uh, if you're new, welcome, and if you're coming back for episode two, welcome back. Um, I have a few things to talk to you about today. Uh, starting with um, my knitting, the things that I'm working on, I have one finished object. Um, I showed this last week. Um, this is a sock head hat um, for my nephew, Liam, that I finished this week. I was here when I showed it off last week and I pretty quickly worked it up to the end. Um, and I'm really happy with how it turned out and I think he will love it too. Um, this is out of uh, oh, um, socks that rock in a mill end um, from Blue Moon Fiber Arts, and uh, it's a sort of modification of the sock head pattern that I I do quite frequently. It's got a slightly shorter brim, uh, so it doesn't use quite as much yarn, and it's not quite as long in the in the head too. It's still pretty slouchy. So, and this is for a ten year old, um, so it's a little bit smaller this way as well. So that's my one finished object for this week, uh, but I've got lots of other things that I've been working on. Let's see where to start. Uh, these are the vanilla socks that I've been working on that I've shown a couple of times. There's one sock finished. I love the color of these. And oh, it still has its marker in it, but that one's been finished for about two weeks probably. And this is how much I've got done of sock two. These travel around with me, usually in my purse, and I work on them in the car. When I'm waiting places, I had a doctor's appointment this week, so, you know, in the waiting room of the doctor's appointment, stuff like that. So they're a little bit slow going, but um, but they're coming along, and uh, hopefully I will be... I'm hoping that maybe I'll have these finished for next week, so let's see. These are out of uh, Hampton Art Yarn, so it's Deep Stash. Um, yarn I got I would say about five years ago maybe and uh, I, so I'm sorry but I don't have the tag anymore and I don't know the colorway but they're very pretty and the other socks that I have been working on this week I last week I showed off uh, my sock drawer and I talked a lot about socks and it reminded me how much I enjoy occasionally a complicated sock pattern with a bit of challenge so I uh, pulled out a pattern that I had been planning on working on for a while and got started on these. This is how much I have. Uh, so far that's the back of the sock. There are different charts on the, that's the front of the sock. The pattern is the Samwise socks from, um, I think the book, it's an ebook that's called I think, The Fellowship of the Socks. And I knit the first pair in there, which is Frodo, and I showed those last week. Uh, when I showed all my socks and this is the second pair in the pattern or in the book um, The yarn is really nice to work with. This is Old Maiden Ant in the colorway Buttermint and uh, I'm really enjoying it. It's a nice uh, tight. I think it's a four ply but it's um, It's also really soft and quite springy so it works quite nicely for you can see this little cable pattern that there's this tiny little cable here and then there's these sort of X's and O's cables that run up the back of the leg and will go down into the, the heel. And then this this little sort of, I think of kind of as a tree or a bird's foot, maybe something like that. And then there's seed stitch, that big seed stitch panel that runs up the side, if you can see that. So these take a while. Um, they're cabled on every, mostly on every second row. In fact, yes, they are because these these little tiny cables here go on every second row. So they take uh, they take a while to work on. There's also some lots of twisted stitches in them and that sort of thing. Um, they're probably not for the faint of heart. <laughs> uh, all of her patterns are, are fairly complex, but they're really fun to work on. And I've been occasionally uh, sitting down and doing a couple of rows on these and really enjoying that. So those are the two socks I'm working on. I've also been working on my um, Vertices Unite shawl by Stephen West that uh, I've been that I showed last week as well. Last week I was about halfway through this green bit, which I love. Uh, that I was about to I think about 
I didn't put a marker in, but I was about to here. And so I've gone all the way up to finish with the green, which is section three. The next thing is a section that will pick up along here, I believe, section four, uh, which will be in <coughs> this color, this lovely, even more green. Um, but it's got some of the same green in it. You can see that's in that, in this one. And uh, <coughs> so that's, and this one here that's on a holder is section two, which has got some of that green and another color in it. And that was section one, which is stripey. Um, so there's six sections to this in all. So technically I'd be halfway through, although I think, <coughs> excuse me, a little frog in my throat. This section and this section are the biggest two. So I'm probably actually more like uh, maybe two thirds of the way through. Uh, it's coming along nicely. I'm as I said, just about ready to pick up and start on section four. The yarn I'm using for this is skein top draw sock uh, in five different colors. So yeah, I'm really enjoying that and really looking forward to getting onto the next section of that. And then the last thing I've been working on this week, um, I talked last week about how I was going to, uh, I had a couple of other sort of projects lined up to go and um, a thing you'll learn about me if you watch this podcast a few times is that I change my mind quite often. Um, so I actually started in on a, a different project than the two I mentioned last week, but one that I've had on the on my mind for quite a while I had actually had the yarn balled up for it and the pattern printed out and it had been sitting around for a while and I actually thought oh let's start on this and this one is a, a cardigan this is the drifting cardigan by Cecily Glowick McDonald and um, so I got I'm almost through the first set of increases this is a top-down little cardigan it's a it's a short cardigan a crop sort of cardigan in the pattern I'm gonna actually make it longer than than the pattern calls for um, I'm making it out of uh, Volmiza in this is the color so pretty mm, it's the color Indish rot uh, which I think is Indian red and it's a, a, a variegated red as you can see it's sort of red darker red sort of orange and orangey kind of tones in it overall sort of orangey reds um, and yeah I, I mean it doesn't look like much right now right because it's just all kind of squished up on the needle but um, I think it's intended that the you have this sort of roll to the collar I'm not sure whether I'm going to like that because it's rolling a lot I may put an I-cord edge around that but um, I have two skeins of the Volmiza this is where I'm at in the first skein and then um, I'm going to actually stripe in in the body some black um, in some sort of alternating in different widths and stuff stripes and I'm going to use that to extend it with the two skeins that I have so that'll be fun and I think this is going to knit up pretty fast this is about two days worth of, of work and as I said I'm almost done with the as you increase in a raglan this is the back of the shoulder and then you pick up along the front somewhere if along here um, to start onto the body so that's coming along nicely I'm enjoying I have uh, haven't knit with the Volmise in a while I, I have a lot of it um, it was my kind of first ever it was sort of my gateway drug to indie dyers and I bought a lot of it for a while a number of years back um, and uh, <clears throat> and a lot of it has just sat in a bin in my yarn room for a while so it's fun to knit with it again and I um, I just adore her the, the the depth and the vividness of her colors I think is what drew me from the beginning to her yarn so that's the fourth thing I've been working on this week um, the Sorry, I'm gonna a little water here. The other thing that I wanted to um, show and talk a little bit about today was um, the other main crafting thing I do. Um, I'm predominantly uh, a knitter. I don't crochet except for the occasional single crochet thing that I have to for a pattern, but I'm not really very good at it. And um, 
I do a little bit of sewing and I will talk about, uh, but really a little bit, mostly just project bags that I make and I'll talk about those on another episode. But um, the other thing that I got into, I guess maybe three years ago now, two, two and a half, three years, something like that, uh, coming up on three years, I think, is um, spinning. And uh, and I'm a spindle spinner. I, uh, I'd like to have a wheel and I probably will have a wheel at some point someday. But for the moment, I've stuck with spindles because, as you'll see, I got into spindle spinning and then I bought a lot of spindles. So I've invested a lot of money in a lot of beautiful spindles I have. And um, and so I feel like if I, at this point, if I got a wheel, I'm not sure that many of these spindles would get as much love as they should. Even now, they're not getting as much love as they should. I sort of go in, in um, what would you call it? Uh, uh, fits and starts with spinning. I will, you know, the, I've done the Tour de Fleece the last two years and so sort of for that chunk of time I will be spinning, that will be my primary craft. But uh, a lot of the rest of the year I will go on little binges where I will spin for a, cup, a week or two and work on a project but then I might not actually pick up my spindles and, and do any spinning again for you know, a couple of months. Because I feel like, unfortunately, I feel like uh, it competes with my knitting time. Um, and it's also, my knitting is so much more portable. Spindles theoretically are portable, but I haven't really, not in not in quite the same way. Like I can take a vanilla sock and I can knit pretty much anywhere. And I can take, knit on a vanilla sock at work most of the time. But I can't really spin at work or it's just not really appropriate or that kind of thing. So it's mostly something I do at home. And... Um, yeah, it, it just, it com I feel like mentally it competes with my knitting. Uh, so I have to kind of carve out, I think, a little more time to do it. I'm trying to, I think maybe I'm going to try and, you know, make sure that I do 15 minutes at least on it, say two times a week and, and get a little bit of headway because I actually, as you'll see, own a lot of spindles and I have a lot of fiber and I would, and I really enjoy it when I do it. So yeah. Anyway, I thought I'd show you some of my spindle collection. So um, I started out, the, actually the very first spindle I bought, well, no, the very first spindle, I, I did buy a spindle kit with two kind of inexpensive, I don't even have those up here to show you, um, in, inexpensive unfinished wood spindles. One is a big, like about that big, um, Turkish spindle and one is a, a top, oh, actually there were three because one is a top whirl and one is a bottom whirl but uh and I use the bottom or the bottom whirl one I have uh is is quite heavy sometimes I use it for plying um but sometimes it's even a bit heavy for that um but then the first sort of fancy spindle I guess that I bought uh, after the uh, after I kind of figured out the basics on those inexpensive ones was this one, which is a very beautiful Russian spindle. It actually has a little bowl, which I didn't bring up with me, but it comes with a little bowl that matches it in this beautiful, beautiful wood. See that? This I have not mastered really yet. I have to spend some time and, and figure out how to work this. As I said, it's my first outlay of money on a good spindle, and it hasn't really had any work done on it yet. But that's something that I'm going to work on trying to uh, master. The, after that, um, I bought a, a number of different top whirls, and those are the ones that I use quite often. Um, this is a, a lovely, lovely one, um, the Butterfly Girl spindle, I think you can see the beautiful top to that. Uh, it's sort of a medium-sized, nice lightweight spindle. It's got a little bit of fiber. I've been practicing, sort of learning uh, ply on the fly, which is the, like... Um, chain plying, Navajo plying, um, on this. I haven't gotten particularly good at it yet because I haven't really invested enough time in it, but that's something I'm going to uh, work on a bit more. Um, most of the plying that I have done so far has been to ply, but uh, I, I like the idea of this. I like the fact that you can keep colors together and don't get as much barber pulling, so I need to work on that a bit. But So there's that one. Um, then I got... Uh, I don't know what order the rest of these came in, but this this one I've used a lot. This is a Bosworth. This is a beautiful spindle. Nice. I think it's a medium-sized one. Um, 
nice weight to it. It's, it's kind of a medium weight and, and uh, spins really, really nicely. I've done a, a number of projects on this and I really enjoy working with this one. Um, I think my favorite of the sort of medium sized, uh, larger, slightly larger whirl, top whirls is Kundart spindles. And I have three of these. They're so pretty too. They're, that's the top of this one I love. And see that they're, these are a pretty good size, uh, but they're very lightweight, which I really like. So they spin like crazy. And the other two I have, I'll show you, um, have completed spins on them. Um, that are sitting around waiting to get plied at some point and see the top of that. So pretty, so pretty. These are so nice, so nice. The beautiful designs on the top of the spindles sort of are part of the pleasure for me of spinning, looking at, at this while you're working. Um, so there's that one. And then there's this one as well. These two have, uh, these two are going to be plied together. These are actually from a, a set of hobbledehoy battlings that I spun um, in, before Christmas, I guess. And um, they're just waiting, to, these two will get uh, two plied together. They look different in color. And what I did is I'll show you, I brought up some um, bat, hobbledehoy battlings. They're my, they're totally my crack. I, I have been in and out of her battlings club a number of times. I've stopped recently on the last round, I think just in the new year, because I have lots more uh, at the rate that I'm spinning right now. It'll take me quite a while to spin up what I have. Plus I have quite a bit of other fiber. So, uh, but, but this is what I, I enjoy spinning her battlings more than anything. And, um, I think what I did with these, if I remember correctly, was I sort of divided up the lighter colors, the sort of blues and grays that were in this set of battlings on that one and the sort of darker colors on that or on that one and then apply those two together and I did a beautiful project um, last year with <clears throat> some of her battlings that were in sort of bright pinks and oranges um, and there's a little bit of blue in there and there was lots of colors in it I don't have any to show you because I spun it plied it and then I knit it into a beautiful shawl that I gave to my mother for Christmas so um, and that, so that was a terrific project. And that was the first time that I really had uh, done the whole process, up, including a project from my spinning. And that was very, very satisfying. And my mother loves the shawl. She says she gets so many compliments on it. So really fun. Um, then I got uh, this beautiful little guy that I really love as well. This is a Spanish peacock. What's, what's the top of this? You can, if I hold it the right way, I think you can see the little little skulls on there and I just adore this one. Uh, again, nice and lightweight, uh, very good spinner as well. I haven't used this in a while and I should get something going on that. Uh, another really fun one is um, Aaron Makes Stuff. This is one I, he did, I don't know if he's still doing these or not, but he did a whole bunch where he cut um, pencil crayons and used them. So you can see there's a bunch of red and pink and brown uh, pencil crayons in there and set in acrylic, I suppose. Um, that's a nice sort of medium sized one too. Um, my Trindle, I uh, love this spindle. This is a great, in terms of portability, this is a fantastic portable spindle. Um, the little arms come out so you can, um, you can change the weight of this by heavier. I have a second set of arms that are heavier and in fact, I can put them on with these so that it ends up with six arms instead of the three that you can see right there. And um, so that you can you can change the weight to it. And this spins really fast and super lightweight. Uh, it's carbon, so you know pretty indestructible. You can take those little arms up, put it in a little bag, throw it in your, your purse. You could travel with it. Um, I'm going to be doing a Quite a bit of traveling a couple of times this year so I actually may take that with me as a nice little portable spindle. Um, this is my most recent acquisition. Again, I love this. Love this spindle. This is from Acreworks. Um, it's a laser printed whirl on it. Um, nice long shaft there. The whirl comes off. Again, this is an and it's also a carbon fiber uh, on the stock or the stem. I don't remember what that's called but um, this also is nice and collapsible. You can take that whirl right off and, and pack it in a 
bag or whatever. This has got the spin that I'm currently working on, which is um, some beautiful fiber by Spun Right Round, I think. I have some of the actual fiber here. You can see the amazing colors in this. Um, kind of see some of those other colors peeking out under that pink. I just split this into two equal I split the, the braid into two equal parts. This is the last part of this one and then I will do the other one and uh, apply those together. So those are that's really fun, just the beautiful colors in there. And then I also have two little Turkish spindles. I haven't used these anywhere near as much as I should either. I'm not as proficient with spinning on the Turkish spindle as I am on the, the drop spindles. Um, but this is a beautiful wood one with the grain on that. It's gorgeous. This is from IST Craft in the UK. I ordered this one online in their shop and they have tons of fantastic uh, top roll spindles and beautiful uh, Turkish spindles. And this is kind of a medium size, I would say. You can sort of see if like the size of it if I hold it up with my hand there. Um, and then I have a tiny little baby one. Um, for, I ordered this off Etsy, I can't remember, I, quite a quite a while ago. It was, I think, think it was actually I got this and then I think I got this one maybe next. Um, this, uh, so I can't remember, unfortunately, the seller I got this one from, but it's a tiny little, you can see the size of my hand, it just has a tiny little bit of scrap, little bit of fiber, I think it was a little fiber sample that I just was practicing uh, on. I find this one hardest to kind of keep it keep it going for some reason some people seem so proficient at these um and i guess like anything else it's practice 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 right so if i spent a whole bunch of time with this i'm sure i would get better but so that's my spindle collection and my um and my spinning um as i said there's a lot of great different there's so many amazing spindle makers out there and so many great spindles you can get. And I know I've seen on a couple of people's podcasts that they're taking up spindling, they're starting it, they're learning it. It can be, um, I'm completely self-taught. I knew I wanted to try it, but I didn't really know anybody in person who knew how to do it. Um, or I didn't know if I knew anybody in person. So I, watched a lot of videos um, and that's what I sort of recommend is uh, the thing that helped me I think the most that to really get started at it was the craftsy there's a craftsy class on spindling and I bought that class and I watched it several times I watched it and I kind of tried it out a little bit then I watched it again and I, I kept going back to it as I kind of got the first step and then the next step and then the next step like by the time I got to applying I think I had watched that video maybe four or five times and that really, really helped me a lot. Um, I've also, there's some great groups on Ravelry and I spent quite a lot of time reading threads on some of those groups and stuff like that. And then spent a lot of time practicing. The biggest thing that I kind of learned in my journey of teaching myself, and as you can see, I'm still working on teaching myself because I'm still working on the um, chain plying and I'm still working on uh, figuring out some of the different spindles and stuff. Um, the biggest things that I learned were were kind of about experimenting with fiber. I think the I, it's spinning can be spindle spinning can be frustrating at first because you you drop the spindle a lot. You um, it, it's hard to get the hang of the drafting and get the yarn get the singles to a consistency you want and figuring out how to get as much twist in as you as you want without over twisting and um, I found it actually useful to experiment with different kinds of fiber because the first fiber that I got actually was an impediment because I had two different fibers one of which I had a heck of a time drafting it was sort of a, a rustic -y, well, I think it was just a wool I don't uh, yeah and it it wasn't drafting well for me and that was causing me a lot of of frustrations and then the second fiber that I was using was lovely but it was in punies um, which are like roll eggs or those thin roll and I found that really really hard to draft when I was just learning so eventually I, I switched to I think the first successful ones I did were things like uh, BFL 
um, stuff that has a, a bit of a longer um, fiber or longer hair to it fiber I can't think what it's called right now but um, helps with the drafting and pre-drafting really helps like usually I will take a chunk of this pull it off that's the wrong end I'm working from this end but and then pre-draft it so that I get nice and uh, you know get it get it where it's starting to want to draft itself already a bit uh, so yeah, my advice for people who are, are new to spinning, experiment with different fibers, find out what works for you. Sometimes getting the right fiber will sort of unlock the the body motions of it to, because it takes a while to get that where it feels, it's like knitting, that where it feels instinctive enough that you don't have to think about every little movement of everything you do and instead you can start to concentrate your thinking on, oh, now I'm going to focus on how how well I'm drafting this fiber because my hands can spin the spindle and do all those things kind of automatically. So yeah, that's my little um, chat about my spinning and I will try and show more spinning on the podcast as, uh, as I go along. The last thing that I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about today because what's sort of something that's been, I've been thinking a lot about podcasts in general and I've been thinking about podcasts I watch and why I watch them and a bit about why I wanted to do a podcast. And uh, and it's interesting because I think there are a lot of podcasts uh, out there and there seem to be a whole bunch of new ones that have cropped up in the last maybe six months to a year. There's a lot of new podcasts that are sitting in the somewhere in the 10 to 15 to 20 episode range. Um, so there's so much choice of podcasts that you can watch. And, uh, and I watch a lot of them. Um, I, but, but I do have favorites, ones that I will come back to, um, ones that are the ones, the first ones that I look forward to when they have a new episode. And, uh, there's a variety of different reasons. And I thought, um, it's interesting, like what I, what I enjoy about it, I, I don't particularly feel like I have a knitting community, much of a knitting community here where I live. There are lots of knitters, I'm sure, but I'm not don't feel super connected to that community. Um, it has a lot to do with the job I do. Uh, I work in the arts uh, primarily. I'm primarily I'm a stage manager in professional theater and so a lot of the time I work at nights um, and when I'm rehearsing a play uh, it's six days a week, very long, very intense hours, sometimes 50, 60 hour weeks. And it just doesn't leave time in my day particularly to go to a knit group. Um, I know there are a couple of good knit groups in the city, but I just, I feel like I, by the time I invested a few weeks in going and getting to know people, then I would have a big chunk of weeks where all of a sudden I couldn't go again for a while. <laughs> and um, so, so yeah, I have, I have a couple of knitting friends here. Um, not, but I don't really have a bunch of people I knit with and I watch podcasts often feeling like that's a way for me to people to have some people I knit with. Um, additionally, some of my, some of the people I know in the knitting community and feel, uh, connected to live quite a long way away. I have, um, my really good friend, Pat, who lives in Texas, uh, and she and I FaceTime together quite a bit, but I met her at the Zombie and Apocalypse retreat, which I went to last year and the year before. And I met a bunch of fabulous knitters there and felt like I kind of began to form a bit of a knitting community. But again, those are all people that live in, far away from me, most of them uh, in the United States. So so podcasts are kind of a way to for me to to connect to other people knitting and it's enjoyable to me to sit and knit and watch other people talk about their knitting and I hope that's what um, that's what I can offer to people as well in terms of doing this and it's a way for me to reach out and talk about what I'm doing. I noticed an interesting thing on a bunch of these newer podcasts that that have, are coming up which is I, I think that the primary reason why a lot of those people are are doing their podcasts are for the same reasons. They're there to reach out and to create community and to feel a part of, to feel connected uh, to a knitting community and part of a, a larger thing and to share something that they love. And, uh, but it, but one of the things that's interesting is I find that some of those podcasts, there's also become a thing where half the podcast is about connecting to the pod, other podcasters. And 
I suppose there's not, I, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. Don't get me, don't get me wrong. I think it's fantastic. They're creating that community that way. But interestingly in that desire, I think for people to, to reach out and really be a part of the community, there's also an element of that, that, that I don't know, maybe it's just me, but also ends up feeling exclusive in a funny way because all these people are talking about each other and all connected and there's a lot of uh, saying hi to each other and having these kind of conversations that actually make you feel a little, make me feel, I should say, a little like not part of that community. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what all of that means. It's just something I've been sort of thinking about and, and mindful about and I, and I want to, well, I want to talk a little bit about podcasts I like and why I like them and ones I watch because I'm hoping that maybe I can steer some other people to some of those podcasts. I also want to be careful not to create that uh, environment where it becomes a little bit like there's a club that you're maybe not a part of. So anyway, I'm just putting that out there as kind of some thoughts that I've been having this week. But the a couple of the podcasts, um, two of these are ones that I've watched for quite a while and one of them is a brand new one and and but there are three of the ones I'm really enjoying um, Kristen of Skein Studio um, is the first one that I've been watching her podcast since she started because I've been buying her yarn for years and years and I absolutely adore her yarn and I adore her she seems like a really really lovely person and uh, and I feel like maybe you know if we lived if I lived in Australia I would I would try and get to know her personally. I said her yarn is amazing and she's very knowledgeable. I, what I, one of the things that I really get from watching her post, podcast and really enjoy and being a member of her group, I've been a member of her group on Ravelry for a long time um, <clears throat> and she's very active in her own group and stuff and she also has a blog uh, or website that with her yarn but there's a sort of a blog there too, is that she talks about techniques of things. She talks about um, she did some of, on some of her early podcasts, she talked about dyeing techniques and some of the techniques she uses. And she's talked about some different knitting techniques. And when she shows her knitting, she's great at talking about, um, different things. And I, so I always feel like I learn something from her when I watch her podcast, which I, I love. I also just find her something about her personality. She's just very soothing and calming. So really enjoy that one. So that's Skein Studios. I'll put links to these, um, down below my video and uh, the second one is another one that I really really enjoy watching and really look forward to every week when her episodes come out is the yarnings podcast with Christine I met Christine at um, zombie knit apocalypse and uh, so I got to know her first a little bit in person and uh, really liked her then I started watching her podcast and I just I love her uh, sunniness and and positivity um, and I also find one of the things I get from her podcast that's I, fantastic, I think, is I get so much inspiration from the projects that she does, the knitting she does, the spinning she does. And I find that there's, I've been thinking about, so what it, what is it? Because more than any other podcast I watch, I think, everything that she knits, I feel this desire to want to knit that. And I don't mean necessarily that I want to knit that pattern or that yarn, it's just that there seems to be so much pleasure in what she's making and so much personality. So much of her personality is going into these projects that she's doing. She's, I think she's a genius at adapting patterns to suit her personal tastes, her figure, how things will fit her and flat her, flatter her. And I find that extremely uh, inspirational as well. It really makes me think a lot about how I can um, make things sort of, I, that makes me think, first of all, kind of what my sense of my style might be. And then it makes me think about how I might be able to adapt things so that they are things I really will wear and that will be part of my wardrobe. And, and so I'm learning a ton from her in that respect. So again, that's a, the Yarnings podcast with Christine. And the last um, and newest one to me is Soxetra with Shannon. And uh, um, that's a Canadian podcast. There's a lot of new Canadian podcasts uh, on the on the market, if you will. And that's so fantastic. And, and Shannon uh, is in Vancouver. And I've really, really been enjoying watching her podcast um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, again, I mean, I just, I love that I she's 
in the same world as me in the terms of I know Vancouver I know places that she talks about I know some of the Canadian yarn she talks about all that kind of stuff but I just love that on her podcast she talks about a lot of other things besides her knitting um, and they're real things she talks a lot about real life real world uh, things she's working on about herself things she's thinking about in the world about what kind of person she is in the world and she shares just her her journey uh, yeah, she calls them shouty shan things or something like that but she shares these ideas and every single time they're things that make me really think and and make me think oh that's a great idea that I want to incorporate a bit more into to who I am and how I move in the world and stuff um, her latest one she had a she was talking about um, grammar stuff and I, I won't even try to get into it here go watch her podcast but but it stimulated a fantastic conversation uh, last night I watched that episode and my husband and I got into a conversation a bit of an argument initially that became then a great conversation about the stuff she was talking about so I love and appreciate that uh, element of her podcast I also again really respond to her personality and um, wish she lived closer so that I could hang out with her so anyway so those are three podcasts I'll probably try in a couple of other episodes to include a, f a couple more of the podcasts that I really love but for now those are three that I enjoy that if you haven't seen them all three are, are I think worth checking out um, again at the end of the day I think it's best you know everybody's different in it and everybody will find different things that they respond to in a podcast so you look for things that speak to you so that's going to be it for me for today. Um, again, I uh, thank you all for coming to watch. I did just start up a Ravelry group. Um, if you're interested, it's Creative Mojo on Ravelry. And uh, I hope you all would come in and uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel and uh, come and join the group. And uh, when we get a few members, we'll uh, talk about what could go on in that group. So uh, cheers for until I talk to you next week and uh, I hope that you have great creative mojo. Thanks.